Hello and welcome along to the programme. I'm Justin Briley, your host for the next hour and a half here on Unbelievable. What a show we've got lined up for you today. My special guest is Michael Behe. He is the foremost intelligent design proponent in the world. And he is, of course, my special guest for Darwin or Design, an evening with Michael Behe on Monday, the 22nd of November. If you haven't already put it in your diary, do so now and do book in. It's essential to pre-register for this event happening at Westminster Chapel in London on Monday the 22nd of November. Do go to premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable to find out more and to register yourself. Uh, it's only cost £10 and you get a free DVD as well with every booking. premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Time to get into the show, meet our guests and find out what we're talking about in terms of intelligent design and evolution today. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Well, I've been really looking forward to today's programme. As I say, uh, Michael Behe joins me on the show. He is Professor of Biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, author of Darwin's Black Box and more recently The Edge of Evolution. Today on the programme, we're looking at intelligent design. Michael, perhaps one of the foremost proponents of intelligent design in the world. We're asking today, does modern biochemistry show that life is intelligently designed? And to help us look at that today, Keith Fox is with me in the studio Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Southampton, also Chairman of Christians in Science. He says intelligent design is a misguided and unhelpful incursion into science. So we're going to be hearing two very different views on the programme today that aims to get you thinking every week. Well, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me on the programme today. Uh, It's a great delight to have you with me. Of course, uh, Michael, um, you're coming to us by the wonders of modern technology from your hometown. (laughs) But but, but you're on a a radio line, which gives us a great, great quality signal. Um, Michael, before we begin, you're, you're coming over to the UK in November. Uh, we, we chatted briefly about this a couple of weeks ago on the show, but, but tell us, what, what is the point of this trip for you um, coming over here and, and kind of trying to spread the word about intelligent design? Uh, well, uh, the main reason is that I, I think many people, not only in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom, have a uh, um, distorted view of intelligent design. They think of it as biblical creationism in disguise or at least some sort of uh running uh running dog for for uh creationism and i want to uh show people that in fact it's it's not that it's it's uh, a scientific idea it's based on what we know about life not what we don't know about life and and that the reluctance to uh discuss intelligent design seems more uh, a philosophical reluctance than it does uh, based on data. I mean, it, it could be said you're almost the equivalent of a, of a scientific heretic, Michael. Um, yes. you, if, if, as I said last time, even on your, your university webpage, you kind of have to put a disclaimer saying, my views are not representative of the biology department here at Lehigh University, etc. Uh, um, right. I mean, let me t- just a little bit kind of tell you what Richard Dawkins um you know, replied to me when I invited him to discuss with you uh, when you're over here in the UK. Um, he, he said that um, he didn't want his name to be used as a publicity stunt for the British creationist organisation uh, sponsoring this proposed event. Um, and he says that one of the reasons is he never gives creationists the oxygen of publicity by sharing a platform with them. Um, I mean, he obviously sees you and intelligent design as simply a creationist let's say, Trojan horse. Um, But from what you're saying, you're trying to, that's the whole point, you're trying to distinguish it from a a religious viewpoint. Yes, yes. And and fortunately, I I get more oxygen with Professor Fox here than uh, than with (laughs) Professor Dawkins. Uh, That's right. Here's an analogy for you uh, that might work. Uh, I think uh, intelligent design uh, is to creationism as the Big Bang Theory is to the first book of Genesis. Uh, That is that uh, 100 years ago, all scientists thought that the universe was eternal. Uh, But in the middle of the the 20th century, data came out to show that, in fact, it seemed to be that all the matter in the universe was moving away from each other, as if in the aftermath of a giant explosion. And that gave... 
rise to the Big Bang Theory, and that struck many people, including many scientists, as having religious implications. Maybe this was the creation event. Uh, you know, in the beginning, God mm. you know, made the heavens and the earth. Uh, but it, it did not arise from uh, religious uh, sources, from, from scripture, from revelations, whatever. It was, it was a study of nature that provoked this idea. And I think the same thing for intelligent design, that it uh, does not arise from scripture. It arises from the uh, phenomenal complexity and elegance that has been discovered in uh, life in particular. Uh, so it's, it's, it's based on sure. uh, evidence you, rather you, than You want to distinguish it in that way. I mean, obviously, there, there is, in a sense, you know, because of, in a sense, what it points to, it has a religious connotation, and, and hence why we're discussing it on a Christian radio station. But I, I'd love to introduce at this point my other guest, uh, Keith Fox, who joins us in the studio here in the UK. Keith, thank you for joining me. Um, you Thanks, are, Justin. Hello. You two are a biochemist. Exactly. Um, but you've never been persuaded by intelligent design. I mean, just before we get into the, the, the substance of today's discussion, what do you make of people who, like Dawkins, say it is just creationism by another name? I can see why Dawkins says that. Intelligent design itself is a very, very broad spectrum. It covers everybody, really, who comes almost to the six-day creationist extreme, to those who are almost theistic evolutionists and, and the design is almost in, indistinguishable. Um, so I, I, I sympathise where he's, he's coming from, but I, I do agree with Michael. There is a difference between strict creationism and intelligent design. I think probably to most scientists, they're both equally an anathema. Mm. Um, they don't go with orthodox scientific understanding. Um, but yet I'll, I'd certainly agree with Michael there's a difference between them. I mean, perhaps something that's important to point out here is that despite what Dawkins has said there, Michael, you, you, I don't think you would term yourself a creationist, would you? No, uh, I call myself a biochemist. Uh, <laughs> and part of my job is to try to explain the systems that have been discovered in the, in the cell, or at least that's part of biochemistry job. It's job. And, and you do um, agree with essentially a, a great deal of, you know, modern science yes, is finding you, you believe in common descent. Um, that's correct. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very important uh, to realize that intelligent design is not the opposite of evolu evolution. It's more or less the opposite of Darwinism. And Darwinism, evolution was pre, uh, had been uh, proposed before Darwin, but Darwin's claim to fame was that he thought he found essentially an unguided, unplanned uh, mechanism which could mimic design. And intelligent design says no, uh, the, the, uh, his mechanism does not... Uh, mimic uh, the design features of of life, mm. but it does not say that life could not have arisen uh, a long time ago in the past and descended through common descent uh, to the to the present. Can I, can I draw you out on that? In that I, I'm agreeing with some of the things you're saying about the difference between intelligent design creationism and linking that in with scripture, but it's finding some of the things that we agree on. So at the start, it might be worth making it clear that we agree that the universe is very old and that we agree in common descent. In other words, that we and chimpanzees and many other um, species have a common ancestor. Are we agreed on that as we begin this conversation? Sure. Yes, we, yes, we are. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about it. I thought that's what we'd agree on, but <laughs> the, the, there'll be many within the intelligent design movement who wouldn't agree with us on, on that. Uh, that's right. That's right. And intelligent design is not... I think the evidence for common descent is, is, is very, very good. Uh, but it's a separate question than whether something was designed or not. The yes. question of how something was designed is, is separate from whether or not we can detect that something was designed. Well, well, intelligent design in that sense is a broad church, um, but uh, and, and it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm looking forward to a variety of people coming to listen to you, Michael, on Monday the 22nd of November for this event at Westminster Chapel in London. Um, let me remind you, if you're listening and you want to get along to that, it's uh, taking place, as I say, Westminster Chapel uh, in the evening of Monday the 22nd of November. You can book in, uh, register yourself. That is essential, by the way, to register for that event. You can't get in 
on the night on the door. Uh, that's at um, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. That's the show page or indeed slash be he um, for the events page. But you can get to it either way. So premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Um, now, let, let's talk about intelligent design because um, I've had a, a, a barrage of emails. I don't normally get so many emails in advance of a show as I've had for this one. Um, but obviously, when people hand out you were coming on, Michael, they, they, they sort of, you know, wanted to, to, to get their voice heard. Um, let me, for instance, um, read this one from Mark, who says, um, Michael Behe's ideas have been proven wrong in capital letters, not a little bit right, 100% wrong. There is no science in his proposal. It is not a theory. It's even been proven wrong in multiple tests by Christian scientists. He's not deluded. He's a liar. He's been told he was wrong and only keeps his job because he can't be sacked under tenure. Lying is bad enough, but lying for God is surely even worse. Okay, so lots of accusations, Michael. What do you say? Well, I I think uh, he should take a deep breath and uh, maybe have a little... Little uh, little wine or something, calm down, and and we could talk about this. Uh, well, yeah, uh, opinions run very very strong on this, and it's uh, you know you can find people who say that I was proven wrong, you know, the day that my first book came out, Darwin's Black Box, and then you will say, no, no, uh, other people will say, no, here's a here's a paper that was published in the year two thousand one that proves you wrong. And uh, pr- the proof is, is in the eye of the beholder. Many people have brought forth arguments against uh, some of the points I have made. And I almost always find that they're arguing uh, at cross purposes with me. They, they are not addressing the issues I'm addressing. They're making uh, assumptions that I don't make and... Uh, and so, so I I I, uh, I sincerely disagree yeah. with with the uh, emailer that that I've been proven wrong. I have to say though, in some, in some instances, I, I've seen enough of the articles on say the evolution of the bacteria flagellum that I, I was surprised that the ID people are still pursuing that one. Uh, and just exactly what well, sort well, of evidence eventually will say, OK, I, 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 on that one I was mistaken. Let, 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 let's go to the bacterial flagellum, and just for those who aren't completely au fait with the intelligent design arguments and particularly that that some of the key arguments you put forward over 10 years ago in darwin's black box michael um th- this because in a way it's such um a physical and kind of visual example. I think it's really caught on in, in the public's imagination. But this, there is this um, so-called bacterial flagellum that exists as one of the tiny microscopic organisms in each human cell. Um, it is effectively, I think, a sort of outboard motor for a, a yeah, bacterium. Exactly. And, 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 and you, you made the case in Darwin's Black Box that this was irreducibly complex. That is to say, the, the, the way it's constituted the way it's constituted could not have come about arisen by a kind of gradualistic Darwinian process of evolution. All the parts had to be there at the same time in order for it to do the job it's supposed to do in much the same way as a mousetrap has to have all its uh, parts in order for it to be able to do the job it's supposed to do. Um, Okay, 14 years on from from stating that, you say no one's proven me wrong on that. that's right. And as a matter of fact, it's become more complex than we knew in 1996. So that, in fact, I would argue that the situation has become more grim for Darwinism than it was uh, back in those days. What, what do you say to that, Keith? I'd I, I contradict that. I, I, I think we know a lot more about the bacterial flagellum. We know certainly a lot about the genomics of the organisms than the, the, the genes that code for those things now. And we can see some of the similarities with other components uh, in the cell. I mean, I have two papers in front of me, one of which is entitled Stepwise Formation of the Bacterial Flagellum C- uh, System, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, published 2007. Another one from the origin of the species to the origin of the bacterial flagella, nature of use in microbiology. I'm sure you're aware of those. Uh, and they, they both draw out some of the steps uh, that um, those components of the bacterial flagella, where they could have come from. So, so they well, give, oh, give, give a possible pathway. Yes. Here, I, well, here's, here's the problem with those papers. Yes, I've, I've read both of them. And to tell, tell you the truth, I'd like to sit, sit down and have a, have a beer with you and, and show you exactly why they don't address the problem whatsoever. Uh, those studies were studies in what's called protein sequence analysis. Correct. That is, you can uh, ask if a protein 
which is a, po- a polymer, a, a, a kind of a beads on a string conjunction of things called amino acids. And uh, proteins from one species are oftentimes similar to proteins from another. And we can infer, infer that uh, those two proteins came from a common ancestor. But but again, remember, I don't uh, intelligent design does not object to common ancestry. All these uh, studies did, and, and as a matter of fact, I think the PNAS study that you cited is is not accepted even by uh, other Darwinists who who are not who are not friendly to ID at all. All it did was show that there are similarities between different proteins uh, in different organisms and the proteins of the bacterial flagella. Well, okay, so there are similarities between them, but they were doing other things. Uh, they were not together. In order to build, uh, suppose you had a uh, a parts shop uh, somewhere and you wanted to build an outboard motor, okay? And there were screws around because there were screws on bicycles. And there was a propeller around because there was a propeller on a fan over here. You have to t- take all of those parts and you have to get them together in the right way, step by tiny step, in order to build yourself the outboard motor. Now in the cell, that's a, that's done automatically. There's no conscious agent in the cell. So the information for putting that together uh, had to arise somewhere. And uh, correct. Just, comp- except, just except comparing we, we, the sequences, I'm sorry, just let me finish this. Sorry. Just comparing the sequences doesn't tell you how that gets done. But we do know that things within the cell self-assemble, so that uh, the proteins um, interact with each other and, and form complexities. And if those components are there, maybe doing other jobs, um, which is what the evolutionary view of the bacterial phylogenum is, that those proteins that make up that rather complex structure um, had other uh, other functions at the time that come together within the context of the cell to make a very complex thing, the bacterial flagellum. In the same way, the argument about the uh, the, the, the mouse trap, uh, it, it's a very convincing one. Except when you think, well, I take it apart, I could use no part of it as a doorstop or a tie clip or a notepad. Uh, uh, but in the right context, they come together into something that has a different function. Well, no, I don't. I don't think so. I'm sitting in a room and I see a doorstop over on on the ground here and it's this kind of large piece of metal and i have i have toothpicks at home and i have other things that people have suggested would be swell parts to make a mouse trap with but if i took all those parts you wouldn't be able to make a mouse trap with those parts they are in fact a protein or a, a a piece of something else doing another job makes it harder for that piece to be fit into another system, another complex system, because it's originally shaped for the job it's doing, and it has to be adjusted, at the very least, uh, to its new uh, job. So there's there's nothing about a toothpick or a doorstop that makes you want to say, oh, this is, this is a fine precursor to a mousetrap. And there is nothing about those uh, proteins talked about in that article in PNAS that gives you any indication they would be able to form uh, a complex full gel. But we're not talking about it, those proteins losing their original function. There would be gene duplications in which you, you have gain of function uh, as the new complexity arises. And if it's a new function, that new function doesn't have to be functioning at 100% activity to start with. It can be something that has a very low activity, 1%, but it still works. It's a bit like the way in which I do DIY back in the home. I'm hopeless at it. I find a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of the other and a tool that fits the job. And if I was a professional, I'd use totally different tools. But I I make do, and that's what biology does all the time. Well, I I, I think you're speculating here. Uh, You're an intelligent agent, and so when you go home and work around the house, you might make do with with whatever and and look to see what you should put together. But as we know, evolution, a Darwinian evolution, is supposed to be utterly blind, totally blind. And taking something that was doing something else and even duplicating it, uh, it's still fit just for its other job. Is, is there and, a problem, though, Michael, that you know, a lot of people at this point will say, well, what about your explanation then, design? It's just as susceptible. To, I could just as easily say that, that you're you know, assuming a lot there um, in the sense that it, it doesn't actually explain anything to say it's designed. It, it, all it does is say there's a mystery here, and I'm going to say that it was 
you know, design or perhaps even God that did it. And, and as we do come closer to discovering the pathways that evolution could have taken, then your God, your designer, gets smaller and smaller as the gaps get smaller and smaller. I mean, that, that's a classic objection. What do you, what yeah. do you say to it? Well, I, I would again uh, use the Big Bang as an analogy. When the Big Bang was first proposed, uh, there were a number of scientists who opposed it simply because it seemed to point to God. Uh, you know, what could cause a universe to come into existence except something outside a universe? And there were a lot of, it's easy to find quotes of some scientists who were strongly uh, opposed to it. And what if a uh, physicist back then says, we're not going to, you know, we should stay away from this Big Bang theory because it has theistic implications, some people think. We're just going to wait around until we think of a better theory to explain this apparent motion. Uh, and uh, that doesn't have these uh, unwelcome philosophical implications. I'm, I'm not sure if that, that had had Sorry, happened. Sorry. If that had happened, then science would have uh, uh, would have lost a lot of progress. Because I'm not sure that's a useful analogy. Because the Big Bang is based on a theory of what did happen, whereas I think intelligent design is based on a, what we don't know happened. It, it, it's a gap in our knowledge, and actually saying we can't know. Um, what I'm, I'm fascinated about is supposing. Uh, we ever could know with absolute certainty the way, that, say, the bacteria of flagellum evolved, and I could present you with an atomistic pathway, one step by another. Uh, uh, where does that leave your designer? Uh, wh wh at what point uh, would you put your hand up and say, uh, okay, there is a pathway? Well, if there, if there is one, I mean, suppose somebody did an experiment and they showed that some complex system that I would have claimed were irreducibly complex after a long, long time and after selection pressure and, say, a lot of bacteria in a laboratory and so on. Uh, if that happened, then I would be wrong. But uh, that... It's happened before in, 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 by, in, uh, in science that people have been wrong. Uh, intelligent design is falsifiable. What happens, though, if you say or somebody says that the bacterial flagellum evolved by Darwinian means? And somebody goes in a laboratory to test that and they uh, eliminate, they knock out the genes for the bacterial flagellum in some species that had them. And they grow it under some selective pressure for motion. And they grow it for a long time, uh, 50,000 generations or so. And at the end of it, Nothing happened, or nothing much happened. It, it deleted a couple of genes, but there's nothing new, nothing complex. But Would that... you say then that Darwinian evolution had been falsified? And if not, then what are your criteria for no, falsifying I don't, it Darwinian we, evolution? We can't go back in time to know what those evolutionary pressures are that cause the bacterial flagellum or its, or, uh, it, its originator um, well, we can do to, to start in this. Well, we can do experiments based on what we hypothesize might be those conditions. We're talking about things that have evolved over tens, hundreds of millions of years. So we can't do an experiment over that sort of time scale. But, but is, and, is, is there a problem? problem here then, Keith, that, that uh, while you say, you know, ID doesn't give us any <coughs> explanation, um, the problem is that the evolution kind of, if we're assuming it from the outset, then we, we kind of, everything will automatically fall under the, its, its umbrella. And, and it, you kind of, it's the one thing you don't question in science. And, and I think that's where a lot of people feel, well, surely we need to have a sceptical attitude to evolution itself, not just assume that the things that we don't understand will automatically fall under its umbrella. I think most scientists are eminently sceptical. They, they're they wanting to know more. It, it, they ask the question, how, why? Um, it, the scientist isn't satisfied with the answer that says, I just don't know. But they wouldn't go outside evolution, having said that, would they? Uh, they, realistically? They probably wouldn't, but it is within the context of evolution. Can we put together a realistic scenario that's not just a just-so story, that, that on, in molecular terms, uh, does explain how this could have happened? Uh, and, and as we look over sort of the last 10 or 15 years, the bits of evidence that come, we still don't have anything like a complete picture of the way it, it, that it assembled. But all the, picture, the bits of the jigsaw puzzle that we have in place are still consistent with an evolutionary hypothesis. Well, let, let me tell you about an, an evolutionary laboratory experiment that's been going on in the United States. I, I imagine you've heard of it, uh, Professor Fox, but I um, imagine the listeners haven't. This is the biggest uh, laboratory evolution experiment uh, that has ever been done. It was started about 20 or so years ago by a man named Professor Rich, Richard Lenski at Michigan State University. 
And he started to grow the bacterium called E. coli in his laboratory every day. And every day he would take a little bit of the culture that he grew and transfer it to a fresh to a fresh flask and grow it again. And it would grow at about six to seven generations per day. And he wanted, he was interested in seeing what, how it would evolve. And over the course of the 20 years, because its reproduction rate is so fast, it has undergone 50,000 generations, which is equivalent to about a million years or, or more in large animal uh, generations. Also, he was able to generate enormous numbers of organisms because bacteria are so small, so that there have been trillions of organisms in his experiments. And he found that, in fact, they did evolve by Darwinian means and that they did improve and they grew faster and they did better in the, in the medium in which they were grown. But when he looked to see the mu for the mutations that caused them to improve, he found that, in fact, they got rid of genes. They deleted genes. They turned things off. The best mutation he found was in a strain in which the gene for uh, the gene for making the sugar ribose was just thrown away. It was deleted so that it could not work anymore. He found nothing that seemed to be on its way to a complex uh, system. So the best evidence we have of what Darwinian evolution does is that it improves organisms by breaking uh, by breaking pre-existing systems. We, we, we are going to have to take a quick break here, and I will allow you to come back to this, Keith, because this is important and, and kind of gets to the heart in many ways of, of your, your most recent book, Michael, The, the Edge of Evolution. Um, so we're asking the kinds of questions you've been hearing today, such as um, was life intelligently designed or can evolution in that sense be, be falsified? Um, is there such a thing as a uh, can random mutation, which is obviously the, 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 the engine house of evolution in some ways, um, can that actually produce complexity? Michael says as, as far as the evidence shows, all it ever does is actually reduce um, the level of complexity in a cell. Um, now... I'm sure you want to respond. I'm sure you may want to respond. If you do want to get in touch, uh, then I encourage you to email into the show. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And you can also uh, send me, uh, well, you can phone in and leave me a voicemail message 08456 52 52 52 and select uh, option eight. Um, don't forget that Michael is my special guest uh, for an evening we're calling Darwin or Design? Question mark. An evening with Michael Behe. That's taking place at Westminster Chapel on Monday, the 20th. 22nd of November in the evening. You can find out more about that and book in for it. You do have to book in for that um, if you want to attend. That's at uh, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable, which is, of course, the web page of this program. Uh, I hope you can join us there. And uh, we're going to have uh, a good amount of time for question and answer, because I'm sure there will be many people like Keith who disagree strongly with Michael about this subject who will want to pose some of the difficult questions about intelligent design. Again, uh, log on to premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Click through to the link for the bookings page. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you there. Um, and um, we're going to be back in a short moment's time. Uh, we're going to continue to look at whether modern biochemistry shows that life is intelligently designed or not with my special guest today, Michael Behe, Professor of Biochemistry over at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, author of Darwin's Black Box, and Keith Fox, who's a Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Southampton and Chairman himself of Christians in Science. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to the program that gets Christians and non-Christians thinking, and I'd uh, encourage you to get in touch with the show today. A uh, really controversial subject we're looking at, uh, and it always raises temperatures uh, in, in the scientific world, at least. Uh, we're talking about intelligent design. My special guest on the show today, Michael Behe, probably one of the foremost proponents of intelligent design in the world. It was his book, Darwin's Black Box, that 14 years ago really launched, you could say, the intelligent design movement in its modern form. Uh, his latest 
his book is The Edge of Evolution. We're going to be looking at some of the arguments he puts in there uh, in the course of the rest of the program. Um, he says that, uh, as far as he can see, the latest information on science and biology shows that um, Darwinian evolution is, in some sense, just can't explain the complexity of life if, if we're relying on random mutation, on the purposeless blind forces of evolution. Uh, we'll hear what Keith Fox has to say in response to that. He's Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Southampton, Chairman of Christians in Science. He disagrees strongly with intelligent design. And uh, let me repeat again, if you want to <coughs> hear from uh, Michael Behe in person and be able to ask the questions of him yourself, then why not come along to the event we're hosting at Westminster Chapel in London on Monday the 22nd of November. Uh, and you can find out details on the webpage, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable or phone in and uh, book your ticket at uh, that's 08456 52 52 52 and someone on the phone there will be happy to help you so um we ran out of time and, and I'm sure you were <laughs> wanting to respond to, to what Michael had to say there at the, at the end of that last section, Keith. He was, he was essentially saying, um, you know, all that we've seen in the laboratory in terms of any evidence for evolution is that uh, organisms actually decrease in complexity. They, they, they jettison pieces of their, their DNA. Um, and and you, how on earth can you say that complexity arises when we, we just don't see it in the laboratory. Within the context of that elegant experiment that was done over many years, uh, that, that is, is, is correct. But that's an e, an e. coli, that's one particular bacterial species growing all by itself in laboratory conditions uh, where all right, they were starved of, of glucose at various times, I think, to see how they respond to that. But that's very different from an E. coli that normally lives within your gut and mine um, in competition with other microorganisms in a totally different environment, all sorts of other different selection pressures. Michael. Well, uh, that's, that's a rationalization in my, uh, in my view. This is the, the best and uh, most extensive laboratory data we have. And what's more, it fits pretty well with what we see in, in nature, too. Uh, there, there's a paper that just came out in Trends in Genetics uh, a week or so ago called A Golden Age for Evolutionary Genetics about genomic studies of adaptation in natural populations. And in the abstract, he, he says we've been, able to, uh, we've been able to study now the genetics of evolution in, in the wild. But uh, the problem is that essentially the evolution they study are loss of traits. And he ends his abstract uh, by saying, nonetheless, most studies of recent evolution involve the loss of traits and we still understand little of the genetic changes needed in the origin of novel traits. So Lenski's experiment in which he saw uh, the loss of genes and the loss of traits in his bacteria in the laboratory is exactly what naturalists see when they look in the wild. Uh, let, let me pick up on you on that, because at, at what stage are you prepared to accept that a new trait could come on? I mean, you're, you're a biochemist. You said you accept common descent. Uh, that is saying that there, are, over time there have been new function. Has every new function then been the cause of, of your designer? Not every new function, but I would guess every new complex function that required the interaction of several different parts. So, so this, uh, is the, so, this is the key. So an example that, 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 it, that is cited of a new function evolving reasonably recently is the production of an enzyme that degrades nylon, a man-made fiber. Um, there were organisms that were exposed to actually the effluent from a nylon factory um, evolved the ability to degrade that. It's something that's not out there in nature. Um, it's a new function. Well, no, that, that's, that's, yeah, it's been reported as that, but that's not quite correct. It doesn't degrade nylon. It degrades a precursor or a small organic chemical that's used in the synthesis of nylon. That, that's correct, but it is still, uh, it's still something that isn't out there in nature, and it is a new function. Well, that may be true, but the question is how, how hard is it uh, to do that? And I suspect it's, it's not so hard. Hydrolyzing some amide bond or, or an ester or something like that is not quite the same thing as you know being a uh, an outboard motor. So, but, but this is a function that's evolved should, over in just an, a few decades. I mean, we're, we're talking well, in terms of evolution let, of millions of years. Let me emphasize that intelligent design doesn't say that Darwinism can't 
explain anything. There are many things it's a good explanation for, you know, uh, antibiotic resistance, pesticide resistance, uh, you know, the malaria resistance in humans and so on. We say that it can't explain everything, uh, as particularly the complex systems uh, that I discuss in my book. I, I mean, one so of the is a scientist actually allowed to ask the question to to, to explain it, or, or have you said there there is a point at which we can't go? That, oh, that, that right. scientists always asking questions as to where did that come from, where did that arise, how does that work? Uh, sure. And, and uh, ID seems to me it's a science stopper. It says that I I don't know, uh, and and I never will know. No, that's that's not. Well, again, let me point to the Big Bang. In the same way, the Big Bang could have been thought of as a science stopper. You know, how could we investigate how, what caused a universe to come into existence? What existed before the Big Bang? Uh, so that was a science a stopper, too. It's, it's not that all, all explanations in science are science stoppers in the sense that they purport to explain how something happened. If somebody has a different idea how it happened, then he's just going to have to go out and, and gather evidence for that, his idea. But all explanations in science intend to explain uh, a situation, and, and in that sense to, uh, to, uh, to, well, to remove it from, from that's, that's very uh, the need for further study. That's very different from saying, I, I can't explain it, and we won't explain it, and so we shouldn't go there, almost. Uh, did I ever say that? No, you did didn't I say, say shouldn't I go there. I can't explain or won't explain it? Well, you're saying that there isn't a, an explanation other than the, the designer for, say, how the flagellum arose, whereas the scientist says, I, I, I want to understand the process by which that happened. Well, what if there wasn't a process by which that happened? then the scientist who says that is asking a poorly formed question. It's like asking, you know, I want to uh, study how the sun, uh, how the sun shines by gravitational contraction energy, which was thought, uh, which was the main mechanism thought for the sun to shine in the 19th century. Uh, but that, that didn't pan out because the sun does not, so, shine that way, but but this so, is this is uh, fits in with the, the total sort of biochemical paradigm. Where the, the biochemist asks questions: uh, no, What's the relationship between this protein and that protein? Or what's the relationship mm -hmm. between the genes that code from those? How could they have um, have a, have some form of common ancestor that you've agreed that we have common descent? And, and the biochemist says: How does this all, this all fit together on a molecular biochemical uh, basis? Um, right. and, and to say that there's an intelligent designer who, who, who sort of who did that um, actually says that we're wasting our time asking the question. And I wonder where we would be uh, as a, a scientific society well, if we'd done well, that further down the line. Well, Professor Vox, let me, let me ask you a question because some theistic evolutionists are do think that uh, our universe was purposely fine-tuned and set up as to allow life to occur. Are, do you subscribe to that view or, or, or not? I find that a very convincing view. I, I wouldn't necessarily rest everything on that, but I do find that quite a convincing view in terms of the fundamental constants of the universe, uh, that they well, are it, very, very finely tuned. If you, if you read my book, The Edge of Evolution, through to the end, I actually say you can explain, <laughs> by fine-tuning, you can just say the universe was much, much more more fine-tuned than you have agreed that it is. That it was fine-tuned not only in its laws, not only in uh, the amount of matter it has, not only on, in the charge on the electron and physical things, but it was fine-tuned so that certain events would happen it, in it. Except uh, that so that from the beginning, uh, the universe was set up to unfold as we see it. It was not an accident. Except that that physical fine-tuning is based entirely on what we know, that we know those numbers, we know a lot about them, we know how little they can vary. We, we've inferred the design from what we know, and you're saying that, that Michael is inferring design from what he doesn't what we know. we don't know exactly, yes. Well, I, I would say that's incorrect, because uh, uh, we infer design from what we, what we do know. Uh, when the structure of the bacterial flagellum was not known, nobody was inferring that it was designed. Back in Darwin's day, the cell, the cell was thought to be something simple, a, a little piece of protoplasm, like a kind of a piece of jelly. And it's only because of what science has grown to know of the complexity of the cell 
uh, that the design h- hypothesis uh, comes Let, up. Can, can we, I just move things on a bit here, gentlemen? Yes. I, I, I would like to, um, again, um, read a, a portion of a letter that someone sent in. This is Gavin, who says um, he's a Christian himself, um, but he doesn't agree with intelligent design. Um, he says of intelligent design, it does have an interesting idea at its core, and it does challenge some aspects of biological evolution. But these have been sufficiently answered from a scientific standpoint, so agreeing again with, with Mark, our other emailer. And the controversy is only kept alive within non-scientific circles who are typically predisposed to reject evolution and looking for any attractive means to do that. Well, we've perhaps covered a bit of that as to whether there is a sort of religious element to it. Um, but, but he goes on to say here, Behe is a controversial figure, yes, but he's not a controversial scientist by any stretch, nor conducting intelligent design research in a lab. If he were to successfully do so, it would revolutionise modern biology. I mean, and, and a lot of people have said this, if, if you could somehow, you know, do an experiment to show intelligent design was the case, y- y- science would fall over itself to, to hear your papers and to, to publish them, Michael. But, but it's not, you know, you, you don't have any kind of... You know, it, it is a kind of gap. There's a mystery there. And, and it's a kind of, you know, and as Keith says, a lot of people just see that as non-science. It's a science stopper, they say. Well, uh, you might not be surprised to find that I disagree. I, <laughs> <laughs> you don't uh, say. <laughs> the question is, how, how do we find, how do we uh, decide that something was designed if we don't do it ourselves? Uh, we decide something is designed if we see what I call a a purposeful arrangement of parts, that is parts that are fit together and they do something like say, say the mousetrap. Whenever we see that, then we conclude uh, there has been design. And before Darwin, everybody in the world agreed that um, biology uh, was the product of design. And as a matter of fact, everybody now agrees that <clears throat> that uh, things in biology overwhelmingly look designed. I can quote Richard Dawkins himself saying that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. He wrote that in his classic book, The Blind Watchmaker. We're in the situation now where we have, uh, we have evidence of design in the purposeful arrangement of parts and all we have is promissory notes from Darwinists and, and other folks that, no, no, we can explain it some other way. But in my uh, completely unbiased opinion, uh, they do not have the experimental or other uh, evidence to, to support their it's claim. It's part of human nature, though, isn't it, to see design sometimes where it isn't there. We see purpose where it is accident. Um, we see it where things have just come together in, in, in a certain way. And to some extent what you're saying is actually an argument, I think, from incredulity, uh, which to the person who's a non-scientist is, is eminently believable, that it just seems too complex. But we know that science is like that. You only look at the physics, that the physics of, of the Big Bang, the physics of black holes, is something that blows my mind out. But it, that doesn't say it's not right. Well, so same, same with the biology of the evolution of uh, complex species. Uh, there are there are mechanisms that we can propose for how that may have happened. It, it does seem very complicated. Uh, the the question been, is, I suppose, though, Keith, why why isn't it allowed in in this branch, this particular? I mean, in every other branch, if you like, of um, you know, history, science, uh, well, other, other areas of science, we we would say design. You know, we 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 can say if it looks like this, then you know, if we find these particular scratchings on a cave, you know, in such a manner, we we don't assume that they just appeared there randomly. We do say. Yes, this is evidence of design. So why in this case is design not allowed, I suppose? What, I mean, you say, yes, it kind of leaves it kind of open and mysterious and, and how, where do we go from here? But maybe that just is the way it is, you know, and, and if it's designed, then it's designed. Because we have explanations for it. If, if we had no explanation at all, then Michael would be right. There would be a very good evidence for, for design. But we do have explanations that fit in with the, the rest of the way in which we, we do science. But, but you're saying, Michael, these explanations are simply too patchy. They don't actually overwhelm yes. the, the design uh, argument. Ev- you know, there are, I know of no branch of science that has such loose standards of evidence as, as Darwinism does. Uh, people see things that are vaguely similar and they can believe that, you know, fantastic things have happened. 
so I, I think it's it's actually, <laughs> I, 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 uh, Dr. Fox says uh, mine was an argument from incredulity, uh, but I thought scientists were sp- supposed to be skeptical. On the other hand, I think many Darwinists have the opposite fault. That is, they uh, have arguments from credulity. They they're, say, they're look at this. don't, you, don't mm. you believe that this could have happened? And uh, I, uh, but it's I don't the job think that's the way science should proceed. It's the job of scientists to propose hypotheses and then t- do experiments to test those hypotheses. I- ID doesn't have a hy- hypothesis that I can test. If you put sure a, a mechanism does. together that says this is how flagellum could have arisen, you can do experiments to, to, to say, uh, is this consistent with the way we see and this in other organisms? And beware, of course, that there's not just one flagellum. There are many different species with different kinds of flagella. Uh, yes, we, we can ask well, all those questions of it. But, but as I, I said earlier in the program, uh, you can test design, you can falsify design. I say that complex systems cannot come together by Darwin, by random, without without intelligent input, without intelligent uh, guidance. So all somebody would have to do to prove me wrong is to go into the laboratory and you know grow those bacteria like Lenski did. Uh, and uh, and uh, show that some complex system could well, arise. Well, we, we've heard why Keith disagrees with you on, on that front, but but I think it would be interesting in, as, as we proceed now to, to maybe turn to, if you like, some of the, the numbers that come into this, and you'd particularly de- delve into this in your latest book, The Edge of Evolution, Michael, um, where you talk about the mathematics of you know what it would take to get some of these genetic variations going and, and that sort of thing. But before we do that, I'd like to just, uh, again, let you know if you're listening and you'd like to interact with what we're talking about today, you can get in touch by email, unbelievable, at premier.org.uk. Um, why not also join up with the Premier community? You can find it by visiting the Unbelievable show page at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Click through to the Premier community. It'll take you to the page of this show and, and lots of people engaging in uh, discussions every day there on issues of uh, faith, science, atheism, the Bible and, and all kinds of other issues. So I encourage you to go there. That's also the address, by the way, if you want to register for this event that we're putting on uh, where Michael will be speaking, you can come along, ask those questions that we've been asking today of him uh, that's uh, Darwin or Design an evening with Michael Behe I'll be hosting that event at Westminster Chapel in London um, uh, doors are 6.30 for a 7 o'clock start do hope I can see you there and, and you've got to register in advance for that particular uh, event so I encourage you now to, to, to do it if you're thinking of it and you haven't done it yet um, uh, then go along to the webpage premier.org.uk slash unbelievable to register for that event on Monday the 22nd of November and there's even a, a DVD I understand that anyone who registers will, will receive so find out more about that uh, when you go to that page. Okay gentlemen um, let's get back into the discussion as we continue looking at uh, the whole question of intelligent design and whether it is a credible challenge to Darwinian evolution. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Just as we come towards the end of this section of the program, um, Michael, one of the things you draw out in this book, The Edge of Evolution, is that um, there is, if you like, a a mathematical odds involved when it comes to whether, um, you know, genes will develop in certain ways, will mutate in certain ways and to give beneficial side effects. Um, You you sort of liken it to the odds that are involved with winning the lottery. Um, These are big numbers that you're talking about. Um, Can you just give us a brief overview and then we'll have Keith respond to, to what your problem is on a mathematical level with the, the likelihood of complexity arising simply through this process of random mutation of genes? Uh, yeah, I, I think I can. One, one good example is uh, the sickle cell gene. You know, most people have heard of that. It helps, helps uh, confer malaria resistance on, on some people uh, who have it and live in malaria-ridden uh, countries. Now, it, it uh, comes about because one nucleotide or one uh, of the components of the three billion components of DNA has changed from one thing to another. And the, uh, because of how, uh, how um, faithful DNA has replicated, that change can happen just one in every hundred million times that the DNA is replicated. So that 
uh, sickle cell gene will arise fresh, you know, not inherited from a parent, but freshly from a new mutation in one in a hundred million people. Uh, okay, that's fine, but that's only one uh, change. In my books, I emphasize that many structures in the cell seem to require many changes before they would be uh, active. So if you needed two changes uh, to get some feature, and suppose that one of the changes did not help or uh, was downright uh, unhelpful by or, uh downright dangerous by itself, mm. then you would uh, need one in 100 million squared, which is one in 10 to the 16th. And that's a, a real big number. And you go to the third one or the fourth one, if you need several in a row, you're, you quickly get out of, of what is kind biologically kind of feasible. In the way that matching six lottery numbers instead of just two is, is that that's, much more difficult. Exactly. Yeah, we're it's, talking about it's big easy numbers. To draw, is it easy to draw, you know, if think of a number from one to 50. Okay, it's easy. You know, it's you have a 2% chance of matching one. Well, okay. How about two match two numbers of one to 50? Uh-oh. Now it's okay, one well, in 50 squared. So, so, so the, 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 these are big numbers we're talking about. It's, it's very small probabilities that these things are going to arise in the time scale we're talking about in, and in the, the, the massive population we're talking about. But, but Keith, what do you want to say to this? Yeah, I mean, I think this suffers from something we call the fallacy of large numbers, and many mathematicians have, have dealt with this. What you're looking at is the, uh, the likelihood of one particular mutation occurring in one particular place. The likelihood of a mutation occurring at all is much greater than that. It's the same as if I roll six dice. The chance of, of getting six sixes if I roll them all together is phenomenally small. But if I roll them one at a time and then wait for the, the before I get a, a six on the first dice, before I roll the second one, the chances of, that of getting six sixes are much reduced. The chance of getting any particular deck of cards is very low. Um, but some, every one is unique, and, and you'll get a you deck of cards. You will get a deck of you'll cards. You'll get a deck of cards. So I, I, I don't think the maths hold up, and far better mathematicians have uh, critiqued that uh, edge of evolution, um, the probabilities you put there. Well, uh, I, I, I disagree because um, nature, we, we have evidence from nature. You know, how frequently has the sickle mutation arisen? And how often have, uh, have uh, um, other uh, genetic mutations occurred which give resistance to malaria? The sickle cell mutation has arisen approximately once in every 10 to the 8th people who were born uh, in, in 10 to the 8th people who were born. Other mutations occur more frequently, but the sickle mutation is perhaps the best mutation uh, you can have if you're going to live in a, a malaria country. But as country. you know, e evolution and is not directional, so you can't, you can't determine there necessarily will be a, a means that will, by, ch by changing uh, an amino acid and hemoglobin, that we will be able to uh, get further resistance uh, to malaria. It, it, these things just happen and are selected. So you can't use it to predict one way or the other. Well, if you can't use it to predict, why are you confident that you can, that in fact undirected mutations can do what, what uh, Darwin has claimed for them. Because evolution looks back, not forwards. Y yeah, <laughs> but it, it, as I said before, we have no evidence that it can produce these complex structures. We look well, back you keep, you keep and we that, see but, complex but the, structures, you keep saying that, but, but, but plenty we don't of the scientific see the papers support. show there is evidence. Uh, at, at what point do you, are you prepared to say that is the difference between I can't believe that or I won't believe that? that there are papers there, uh, and you consistently say, I, 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 I find that incredible. I, I want more evidence. At, at what point do we stop asking for more evidence and say, well, okay, there's, there's, like a, say, there's a good the, story the, there? The, the papers that you point out uh, concern common descent. They do not concern the mechanism of evolution, and intelligent design is concerned exclusively with that mechanism. Can, you know, a number of different parts be arranged uh, accidentally or, or randomly and into a lucky configuration and then uh, spread in the population? Or beyond some point, does it take an arranger, a designer, someone to... To make a, sure a that push the parts on that, get so together. What, what is common descent except the summation of lots of small evolutionary uh, steps? Um, now you say you accept well, that, common descent, but, but, but what, what's behind that? 
Uh, are, are you actually denying the evolution behind it? No, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your question what, is. What, what I think you're denying, Michael, is that, that random mutation accounts for it. Um, That's right. And, and, and have directed mutations. And, and directed mutations in that sense, which are essentially designed in that sense. I mean, what, what strikes me as interesting here, Keith, is that you, you are a theistic evolutionist. Now, I, I don't know how, you know, you might parse that in terms of what's going on with evolution and, and, and where God fits into that. But, but in a sense, you, you believe evolution in evolution, you know, in the Darwinian right. account of evolution. But you believe God in some way set that in motion, let's say, that was intended, purposed. Now, do you as a, a, a Christian believe that, you know, God intended for, let's say, yes, random mutations to happen and, and produce hum, humans, incredibly complex humans. But in that sense, they weren't random. God intended them to, 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 to take their pathways they took eventually. Could have taken a different pathway, but actually God intended yes, humans I mean, to be the end result. There was It was directed in that sense. Uh, um, only in the end it might have been directed in that... Um, I don't think there's anything special about our anatomy, our physiology, our biochemistry, actually. Um, but in a way in which God has set the, the, the laws of, of the world up, of, of the universe, is that ultimately conscious people, um, conscious beings, would arise through an evolutionary process. They may not have two arms and two legs and two eyes. They could be totally different shapes, but they would still be beings made in the image of God to relate to him. That's... Uh, I think so, these... so the, I suppose, yes, the, the evolution of consciousness is a significant part of that. We're, we're going to come back to this, gents, because we're, we're, we've run out of time in this section of the programme and we're going to have a, a, a wrapping up. And, and I think we need to get to some of the theological implications of design as well. I think, I think this is important and, and where we often will end up when we're talking about it in the context of, of faith and Christianity. So uh, if you're listening and, uh, as I say, you'd like to get involved, again, the uh, email address is unbelievable at premier.org.uk. What do you make of the arguments of intelligence design specifically of Michael Behe have you read Darwin's Black Box uh, be interested in in your thoughts and don't forget of course um, to log on and uh, register if you are interested in coming along to this evening with Michael Behe when he's over here uh, he's touring the country in November on a speaking dates and the one in London is on Monday the 22nd of November you can join me Justin Briley the host of that particular evening at Westminster Chapel that's uh, Monday the 22nd of November find out more at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable Click on the uh, the link there to book in for the event. Back in just a moment's time to finish up our programme today. Welcome back to Unbelievable, the programme that gets you thinking every Saturday afternoon. Uh, we have uh, a lot of listeners uh, both on our medium wave and DAB service, also who listen to the podcast, though. And if you're listening by podcast, great to have you with me. And uh, let me tell you what's coming up on the show next week. We're going to be looking at the apologetics of C.S. Lewis. Uh, we're going to be hearing from one of the key C.S. Lewis experts in the world, Michael Ward, next week. He's with me in the studio. He'll be in debate with atheist Dan Barker, who's out in the state. Uh, Dan was a Christian. Uh, is now an atheist and he says he uh, re-read Lewis as an atheist and didn't find him nearly as convincing the second time round. We'll find out why Michael believes that C.S. Lewis and the arguments he has for God are still compelling 60 years on from uh, the time he wrote them. So uh, that's next week, C.S. Lewis and his apologetics, if you can tune in. Uh, that's great. Um, and don't forget, uh, I mentioned it a lot, but Hey, this is the show to mention it, isn't it? Uh, we've got this event coming up in uh, on Monday, the 22nd of November with Michael Behe. Uh, he's my guest on today's programme alongside Keith Fox. And if you'd like to register for that event, trying to keep the cost as low as possible, just £10 to register uh, to come along to that evening, uh, you can do so by visiting the webpage premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Uh, and I'll be hosting that event. If you want, if you're not sort of, someone who's familiar with kind of booking things over the internet, uh, why don't you pick up the phone and call Premier Response on 08456 52 52 52 uh, and they'll be able to help you as well. Um, but uh, you'll have to do that on a weekday. They're not, they don't tend to be able to do that kind of thing at the weekend when this show broadcasts, so uh, hold on to that for Monday. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's crack on with the show. We're talking about intelligent design, asking, um, does biochemistry show that uh, life was intelligently designed here on the show that gets you thinking you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio 
It was about 16 years ago, no, 14 years ago, that Michael Behe published Darwin's Black Box and really set the ball rolling as far as the modern intelligent design movement. He's been talking about that on the show today. He is a Christian, um, but this is not a, a kind of Christian atheist issue per se. Indeed, the person sitting opposite me in the show today is Keith Fox, chairman of Christians in Science, but very opposed to the whole concept of intelligent design, feels it's a, a misguided sort of uh, area of science if, if he, if he you would call it science at all um keith it's not just the scientific aspects of intelligent design that you take issue with you you actually object to it as well on a theological level tell us why that That, is that's correct i mean as as a christian i understand that god is responsible for everything for the whole universe upholding the entire universe by his power moment by moment uh, not just uh, isolated incidents and intelligent design reduces god to some form of semi semi deist if you like who comes in and tinkers with something every now and then because it's not good enough i, I want to ask the questions about that what does that say about god who maybe is then designing some things that are not beneficial the bacterial flagellum gives the bacteria greater motility in some instances that make it more make it more pathogenic uh, what what does that say about the, the kind of god we're we're believing in um, yeah, I mean, these these are the questions, and, and I suppose we, it's an aesthetic question in a way, uh, a, a theological question about what 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 does it say of God if God it, is it, somehow intervening it, it does, in, in the in this molecular level almost it, it, of and, life. And, and, and allied to that is the question: if if we have a designer who's coming in tinkering with, how is he doing it? Is that by miraculous means, or is it actually by a purely scientific, rational means? Where if we saw the thing happening, we say, oh yes, it's that reacting with that reacting with that, and it makes sense. In which case there is, it, it, it's, it's just pure biochemistry it's, anyway. Yeah, and it's kind of a semantic difference yes. in a way. Uh, Michael, do, do, you, do you have a problem with the, theo- the theology of intelligent design? <laughs> well, it depends on, on which theology you're talking about. I, I disagree with Professor Fox that uh, intelligent design requires tinkering, quote unquote, uh, which many people think and, and which is mistaken. Uh, and as I've written in my newer book, The Edge of Evolution, uh, everything that uh, I think was designed could have been at um, could have been implied or incipient in the universe from the moment of its creation, from the Big Bang or or whatever. So and the the uh, the fine tuning that I'm suggested that extends deeper than the fine tuning that Professor Fox. Uh, agrees with uh, is not a difference in kind uh, from what he's proposing. It's just a difference in degree. We both agree that God made a universe with specific properties. I'm just arguing that as science has discovered more and more, it seems that God has uh, made a much more specific universe with much more uh, finely tuned uh, properties than than we had guessed before, uh, so I don't see that uh, that 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 intelligent design gives us but, any but more. What you're talking about is is, is a directed process in that sense, and, and and that would suggest a god who directed, you know, as as Keith said, pathogen, pathogenic um, things. So so you know, the, the kind so of con- disease, con- disease, disease and, and everything else that that was intelligently designed as well in that sense and, sure, and that doesn't yeah. sit well does it with the the idea of, of well God? i you know <laughs> uh, you can answer this in two ways you can answer it as a scientist uh, and as a scientist uh, it's not my job to say i'm not going to conclude that the flagellum was uh, designed because it hurt some people and therefore some people might god might uh, blame god uh, it's my job as a scientist to describe nature uh, as I see it, investigate nature as I see it, and and let the chips fall where they may. And you can answer it in a theological way uh, also and say that, well, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, the bacteria that have flag- flagella and malaria and so on that cause people some pain Maybe they're also doing other things which are overall good for life and even good for human life somewhere. I mean, it's, so it's, that one it's, can it's, is- yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me that, that it could be accused of you, uh, Keith, that, that you actually have more of a theological basis for holding to your scientific view of, of events than, than, than Michael does, you know. You, you like evolution in, from the point of view that it, 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 that by its very nature, it kind of 
means God do- can't, doesn't have to be kind of invoked as um, the, pers- the, the God who created the bad bits as well as the good bits. And, and so you have a theological conviction about it yourself. In, in, in a sense, that's correct. But, but theology and, and science, and re- the whole religion, faith thing has to tie together. It's not something where it's in two different compartments. Either it makes a coherent sense together or, or, or it falls apart. And, and I think that the, the theistic evolution does actually make sense theologically and it's, it's acceptable scientifically in terms of what we know. I mean, intelligent design, I want to ask, now what didn't God design? What of those things that we're saying aren't intelligent design that we say arose by natural random processes? Where was God in that? In that? Yeah, and, and if those can arise and yet we still believe in a God who is sovereign, why shouldn't the other things also in that sense, arise. Yes, it's kind of saying that manner. God's responsible for some things and yeah. not responsible for, for others. If, if I could defer addressing that and, and go back to the uh, the the bad bits, uh, the problem that uh, God uh, designed things that uh, cause some pain to people, it does not strike me that theistic evolution overcomes that problem, because a mother whose child has just died of malaria could, in my in my view, justifiably demand of God, why did you set up such a sloppy system to produce life that you you knew there would be uh, such predatory organisms? You knew there would be disease and so on. It, and if if God is God, then uh, apparently he could have designed some other system which would have produced life but without all of these That's a philosophical question of theodicy. Could God have designed a better, different universe? Was there no other way of doing it than this way to, to, so that conscious um, beings with the ability to relate to God would evolve over time and that some of the, the downsides of evolution, and there are plenty of downsides in terms of pain and suffering, uh, were a necessary consequence of that, that process. We have to explain it somehow. Um, different people come from different mm. views on that. We, we're going to have to draw things to a close, I'm afraid, gentlemen. It's been a fascinating uh, time spent with you both. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, Michael, look forward to, to seeing you over here in November. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we, we've got some really interesting things lined up for you. Where there, There's a, a special invitation-only event, uh, but we are going to be broadcasting it as a future show here on Unbelievable so everyone will be able to hear it but where you'll be interacting with um, Michael Reese uh, and that, that will be confusing because I'll have two Michaels to, uh, to address <laughs> but, but, but Michael Reese, the, the former uh, Director of Education for the Royal Society who, who of course lost his job really in, in because of his um, essentially saying we should interact constructively with those who bring you know, uh, creationism and an idea into the classroom. But he's certainly, like Keith, very against intelligent design himself. He's a Christian uh, ordained in the Church of England. That'll be a fascinating discussion. Look forward to, to having you for that. I'm sure Same lots of what here. we've spoken about today will be relevant there. In the